south Gaza. The Hamas-run health ministry there says at least 67 people were killed in what had been designated a safe area. Nottinghamshire Police is to be investigated over its handling of three fatal stabbings carried out by Valdo Calacane. The IOPC says the investigation follows a voluntary referral by the force after complaints from the victims' families. And the Justice Secretary is looking for an urgent meeting with the Parole Board after it granted an appeal to the double child rapist and murderer Colin Pitchfork. Alex Chalk is expected to raise concerns over the decision after he successfully challenged a ruling to keep him in prison. In the city, the FTSE 100 has closed up one point at 75.73. The pound will buy $1.26 and €1.17. LBC Weather with Ripple Energy. Climate action you can be proud of. Staying windy with scattered showers in Scotland tonight. Dry for Northern England and Northern Ireland with a few showers further south and a low of minus two degrees. From Global's Newsroom, for LBC, I'm Tim Daly. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, very good evening. Two minutes past eight is the time. Big breaking news tonight with Keir Starmer basically disowning Labour's candidate in the Rochdale by-election. I'd be surprised if someone didn't ask about that in the next hour because it is Monday's cross-question. Joining me on the panel to my right, Liz Kershaw, broadcaster, who is the UK's second longest-serving female national radio DJ. Do you like that title, Liz? Well, it's sad now. It's tinged with sadness because I was always qualified by saying second to Anne Nightingale. Yeah. And we, she lost. And we lost from her her point ago. of view, it's rather sort of ser serendipitous, is yes. that the right word? Because Liz is actually from Rochdale. Uh, Josh Simons is with us, director of the Labour Together think tank. Uh, to my left, Rayhan Hack is an independent candidate for London mayor. And joining us in a few moments, she's running a little bit late, is Suzanne Evans, political commentator, former, de former deputy chairman of UKIP. Well, there is so much to talk about tonight. I would expect there to be a full switchboard within the next two minutes. Don't let me down. 0345 6060 973. You can text 84850 or say Alexa, send a comment to LBC and do watch us on Global Player. Call 0345 60 60 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. So all three of our panellists are debutants tonight, aren't you? I don't think you've, none of you have done this before, so welcome. Um, we like to have a sort of fairly peaceful discussion. It can get a bit aerated from time to time, but uh, we'll see how things go. Uh, Robin in Whitehaven is our first caller. Robin, hi. Hello. Um, yeah, my question is obviously things have changed a bit um, in the recent minutes, um, but I would like to ask the question, um, as anti -Sem anti-Semitism in the Labour Party being weaponised um, to used against um, people who aren't favourable of the current leader leadership um, or against people who were supportive of the previous leader. So basically, as um, anti-Semitism being weaponised in the Labour Party, and the second part of the question, um, is Starmer slow to act on this um, with what the latest um, movements are of the, what's happened with this by-election candidate. OK, uh, let's go to Josh Simons from Labour Together, first of all. I bet you're expecting to be first. Delighted to be. Um, <laughs> has anti-Semitism been weaponised? Uh, short answer, no. Um, and uh, I say this, for me, this is quite a personal conversation. I was, you know, my second job uh, after university was working for Labour under Jeremy Corbyn. Um, miserable period in many, many ways, but I also happen to be a Jewish person and uh, working in the Labour Party during that period was um, miserable, painful, unpleasant, wrong. I mean, I never thought about being Jewish as being relevant when I went to work for the Labour Party, but it turned out it was. So I quit that job at that point. Um, and did so with uh, the expectation and, you know, a sense that I don't know if I'd ever be back. Um, and Keir Starmer has worked very, very hard, very, very ruthlessly and very, very relentlessly to rebuild trust with my community. And actually, I'm proud of him and of Labour under him for doing that. Um, 
What I think you've seen today is that the place Labour have ended up is that actually that moral clarity, the ability to condemn anti-Semitism. I mean, the fascinating thing to me about the 2019 election was you went around the country and people who had nothing to do, they never met a Jew in their life, would say to me, well, you know, Corbyn's failure to deal with this anti-Semitism thing, I mean, it's really awful, isn't it? It was a kind of sign of complete moral failure, of moral corruption at the heart of the Labour Party. And Keir Starmer's reversal of that and his ability to say, look the British public in the eye and say, I dealt with it, is so, so important to protect, to never have to caveat, to never have to qualify. And in the end, that is exactly what Labour have done today. Do you not think it's a little bit belated, though? Because he could have done it. When this story came out in the Mail on Sunday, there's no question, oh, the candidate actually did say it. It's on tape. Um, if he had acted yesterday, he would have got a lot of credit for it. But I know it's only 24 hours uh, on, and people always demand things are done immediately. But do you not agree that if he'd done it yesterday, it would have been a better thing for him to have done? I think in two weeks' time, we're not going to be talking about the day it took. And, you know, more, more than that, Keir Starmer is a, is a guy who looks at facts, takes his time, doesn't get rushed by the, you know, media bubble frenzy that goes on. And then when he reaches a decision, it's clear, it's often ruthless, and it's very principled. And that is exactly what's happened. You know, I think there is a bigger conversation here, which is that when Egypt came out after October the 7th and said that Israel had failed to heed its warnings, there were millions of people in this country who believed and who took that to mean that Israel had sanctioned the attack on it. That was a big conspiracy theory floating around this country and that is far too many citizens of the United Kingdom right. who believe something that is completely wrong and I also think that, you know, we shouldn't actually duck having that quite difficult conversation. Liz Kershaw. I'm fascinated, Josh, because I, I, you're, you've experienced being a Jew in the Labour Party. So, sorry to ask a question, but... I did want you, your views. Did, yeah, I'll just ask this. <laughs> did you experience anti-Semitism firsthand? Did people turn away from you? Did people treat you differently? I, I, I am just generally interested before I... I mean, the short answer to that question is... Was yes. it evident? Yeah, there were... There were there were both members and actually, frankly, very senior people in the Labour Party who, and I didn't, when I started that job, I didn't think this was going to be true, but who would sit in a meeting with me and um, ask me questions about my views on Israel. I was not hired to do anything to do with foreign policy mm. um, because they knew I was Jewish. Um, and that, you know, I came to see and learn, in fact, about this crazy element of the British left that actually they see people who are Jewish differently, hold them to different standards, expect different views in foreign policy about them. And, you know, screw that. It's no wonder that the British public essentially concluded that Labour was morally corrupt under that regime because, you know, that is what I saw up close. Well, it's really shocking to me because I, I was brought up very much the House of the Labour Party. My mum was a counsellor for me being six years old. So, you know, about 25 years ago. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> and, um, That's what I was thinking. Yeah. And um, <laughs> we, we had meetings at our house and um, I just knew that um, my friend whose dad would come was Jewish because of what we what she had at school, no other reason really. And um we had, you know, Gerald Kaufman round mm. and Joel Barnett and they were just p p big stalwarts of the Labour Party in more recent years. Louise Elman, who was on Lancashire County Council as well. And I can't get I can't get, get my head around this that the Labour Party can possibly be anti Semitic. It, I just but that, you know Evidently, there are elements of that. Um, but do you, do you think, about, going sorry, back to Robin's yeah. question there, um, do you think that this this issue is being weaponised to remove MPs like Andy MacDonald, who's on the left of the party, mm. for saying something that I certainly wouldn't have classed as anti-Semitic? Um, uh, but because he's on the left of the Labour Party, he's a target, whereas this guy... New Labour, Starmer supporter, so they've, they've, they've had to be pushed to get rid of him. Yeah, I think uh, this, this, there's no doubt this, this, you can't have a candidate for the British Parliament who would say something like that. And I'm not um, losing my grip on free speech. I absolutely believe in free speech. And is it all well, statue outside the BBC? Free speech is about hearing people you don't like saying mm. things you don't like. And Rousseau, I'll fight, you can say what you like, and I'll fight to my death for your right to say it. But there's, there's, there's a difference between a well considered, well informed opinion that, that you have a right to express, even though 
you don't, somebody else doesn't agree with it and there's so, there's a, a you know some kind of half-baked ill-informed bogus conspiracy theory which is what he came and out with and, and, he, and he, it stirs things up and it it's it's not healthy and it shouldn't be um, allowed to be part of the Labour Party's agenda in a town like Rochdale. And as someone from Rochdale, mm. I mean, what has Rochdale done to deserve this? Oh, you've got George Galloway standing well, as well. You've, you've got also, um, you've got Simon Danchuk. He's the former who's Labour MP. A former Labour MP. then defected to the Liberal Democrats, he who's did. standing for reform. Are you with me at the back? Yeah. I mean, the <laughs> calibre of these people is really rather poor. You know, compared to some of the, you know, very eloquent and statesmanlike figures that I met when all through the time was going up. But, I mean, Simon Danchuk, I, I just, I, I can't see anybody in Rochdale voting for him because well, they, left in well, disgrace. They did. they did, didn't they? Yeah, but uh, no, I, I just uh, know that Rochdale, and it's perhaps a different discussion, is a different town. It's always been a liberal town. I should declare an interest here because I published Simon Danchuk's book on Cyril Smith. Oh, you did! So, you did! Oh, that, that, that's when he was a hero. That's when he, was, that's when he did a good job, yeah. Rayhan Hack, you're an independent candidate for London yes. Mayor. You must wonder what you've walked into with this. <laughs> well, I think this is the right decision because you can't have parliamentarians who ascribe to these conspiracy theories. But I think, putting aside this issue, there is deep unhappiness in the Muslim community towards Labour's positioning on the Israel-Gaza conflict. We should be calling for a permanent ceasefire. And I think we need to look towards leaders like Emmanuel Macron, President Macron, who's come out and been quite critical about how Israel is overreaching uh, its military offensive in Gaza. And what we're going to see, I think, now with the military offensive into Rafa is going to precipitate a humanitarian crisis. I think Labour need to recognise the unhappiness in the Muslim community and call for an immediate ceasefire. Suzanne Evans. No, I, I, I just... Welcome, by the way. Hello, I'm sorry I was late. Um, yeah, I disagree with that. Uh, I've just actually come through the protest outside Dining Street in Whitehall, and it's just awful. Screaming, shouting, awful placards being waved. I mean, this is this is something that I'm afraid has grown within the Labour Party. You know, we thought maybe it was Jeremy Corbyn that was responsible for this, but no, it clearly goes much, much deeper than this. And I'm sure, I'm pleased that whilst Keir Starmer has come out and withdrawn his support for the Rochdale candidate, it, it has taken too long. And of course, it's taken had, 24 hours. That's too long. That's too long. And you've had other uh, Labour MPs, meanwhile, who've been out campaigning for him. The whole thing makes the party look soft on anti-Semitism, I'm afraid. Um, this is going to run and run. It's not going to go away. What's going to happen? Uh, his name's on the ballot paper. People will still vote for him. He could potentially become the MP for Rochdale. What's going to happen then? Is the Labour go is he going to be allowed to sit with them in Parliament? Is he going to have nope. the whip withdrawn from the moment yep. that he arrives well, in he Parliament? Surely has. that's... It, it, that's it, well, he has indeed. I mean, that's surely unprecedented. Is it? Has that ever happened I think before? it is. I'm sure there are political geeks listening to the programme who can correct me, but I <laughs> Don't, I can't recall, even going back decades, that a political party has ever withdrawn its support. And of course, this is the second one, because the Green Party has done the same thing with their candidate in Rochdale as well. Can I just say, I think they're talking about 24-hour delay for Keir Starmer to act, but he did have a very difficult decision to make, because a large uh, element of the Labour support, in fact, I'd say the majority of the Labour support, it's been always been a, you know, a mill. It was a mill town, working class town. But did they vote Labour? No, they voted Liberal. Bit quirky, uh, but a majority of the Labour vote would agree possibly with the Labour candidates. Well, they and it must did, be which is why they voted well, and they, will, they still will. And there's a, a, and it's a dilemma for the leader of a party when his main support in a town would agree with the candidate, and the party can't be seen. To agree but Liz, what is the point of standing for something in politics if you only stand for something when the herd is behind you? Surely the whole point about being in public life is that you stand up against the mob. We need somebody uh, and, to agree and, with you. Yeah, and, and, and that you actually stand on your principles regardless uh, and, and speak out. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, evil triumphs when good people say nothing. I, I wonder... I mean, it's delicate territory here, but if you look at the number of votes were cast in the selection meeting, I think um, Mr Ali got around 88 votes and Paul War got something like 65. 
Now, I'm not suggesting that every single Muslim in that meeting voted for Mr Ali and every single non-Muslim voted for Paul Wall, but it's quite easy, given those numbers, to get control of a, of a local political party, isn't it? We're not, mm. It's much more difficult if there's like a thousand people voting, but when you've got fewer than 200, um, it, and I think all political parties have got this problem as well, not, not just Labour. And mm. can, I, can I just come in on that? So this is actually one of the reasons why I'm running as an independent, because I was heavily involved in the Labour Party. I was going to ask you, why on earth are you doing that? <laughs> well, because London's in crisis and status quo is broken, and I think it needs a new type of mayor who's got different politics and can work across the political fight to get things done. But just on this particular issue, I think what it speaks to is how institutionalised the whole political process has become in terms of selecting candidates. It's a bit of a game and it's very much around your networks, your machines in a local political party. It's not based on meritocracy and I think we need to throw open the doors more in our political selection processes and have more open primaries and get better candidates in because if he was subject to an open primary, I doubt he would have got selected. Well, I was in an open primary and I mean I was all in favour of them at the time but actually if you look at a lot of the candidates that did get selected for the Conservatives in open primaries, um, where are they now? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that we're on to a pretty deep problem here which is that political parties all over the Western world have been captured by small vocal activist ranks within them that do not not only represent the views of the majority you know people think that all labor party members are crazy i mean they usually are a fairly weird bunch but even the majority of labor party members are much more representative of the public than the minority who actually show up to these meetings and it is a big problem for a democracy if one of the two parties who is going to win a general election selects its candidates, makes its decisions, you know, constitutes itself on the basis of an opinion of a tiny fraction of a percent of the British public that doesn't bear it. I, I actually think the, the problem, problem is that who has the answer to that problem? Well, the, the problem is not necessarily with the party membership. I think the problem is with the people who approve these mm -hmm. people as officially endorsed Labour candidates or Conservative candidates, mm -hmm. because a lot of them should never have been put on the official list, and I would suggest that Mr Ali possibly is one of them. Anyway, we'll move on. Lots more to discuss as well. It's 18 minutes past eight. Weekdays from 7am. Call me cynical. I don't believe a word of it. Straight to the point. Well, why was the promise made? Nick Ferrari at breakfast on LBC. Minister, what the hell are you thinking? Listen on your radio and Global Player, the official LBC.
We are delighted to say Suzanne Evans is with us, Rehan Hack, independent candidate for London Mayor, Josh Simons, director of the Labour Together Think Tank. I mean, it's a very group huggy name for a think tank, isn't it? What, it does what it says on the tin, I, I guess. Yeah, we're Labour and proud. Our uh, <laughs> mission is to help Labour win and govern, and uh, we're very, unlike most think tanks who pretend they're you know, non-partisan and cross-party and so on. We're just very straightforward about the fact that we want Labour to win. Well, you have got Labour in the title. It, the clue is in the name. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not. I think it's... I don't think it should be called the Labour Party anymore. I don't think it's what it says on the tin at all. What should it be called? I don't know. But it's certainly not the Labour Party that was set up in the early 20th century by the likes of my immigrant from Ireland grandparents and the other side from who were working in the mills and and through education which the Labour Party helped to provide and books and libraries no. bettered themselves and, ra and raised themselves up and then gave our gen my parents generation free education higher education got me into profession I got free education got university it's not it doesn't represent people like that anymore that's why there's the so-called red wall problem you know red wall and the problem with that because if you live in Wigan or Rochdale and you're holding down a job in the non public sector particularly and it's you do maybe having two or three jobs to keep your kids fed and maybe run a car and have a decent holiday. Mm. The Labour Party's not talking to you. No, it doesn't. It's, I, I agree, Liz. You know, my great-grandfather stood for the Labour Party three times in the sort of ten, 1910s and mm. 1920s, and he was a minor. How many people like that are in the Labour Party today? How many people like that sitting? There aren't any miners. There are not that many miners. Well, there aren't any miners. Anyway, no, that's true. But I, the I hadn't introduced Liz Kershaw, but that was the voice of Liz Kershaw. <laughs> right, let's move on to um, another question. Uh, Hassan in Kensington. Hassan, hi. Uh, hello. Hi. A Dutch appeals court has uh, prevented the Dutch government from supplying F-35 spare parts to Israel. Should we be doing the same so we're not participating in what the ICJ calls plausible genocide? So a Dutch court today ordered the government to block all exports of F-35 fighter jet parts to Israel over concerns they were being used to violate international law during the war in Gaza. The appeals court said the state had seven days to comply with the order, which echoed alarm across Europe and elsewhere over the humanitarian impact of the war. Israel denies committing abuses and says it's battling Hamas militants bent on... I hate this word, militants, Hamas terrorists, mm. bent on its destruction. Suzanne Evans. Holland has done what it's done. Um, I, I personally don't agree. There are no winners in war ever, really, but I think Israel is in a situation where it has to defend itself. You know, Hamas's stated aim is that it has to wipe Israel off the face of the planet. We all saw what happened on October the 7th. It was horror heaped on horror. Israel has a right to defend itself, and uh, Israel is adamant it's not breaking international law. Uh, therefore, it has the, the, the right to source weapons to defend itself. But the ICJ says it might be. Breaking international law? Well, then it should be hauled into the international courts and, 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 and put on trial, effectively, I suppose. But at this stage, um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm deeply concerned that I think the whole conflict, October the 7th, was horrendous, but I don't particularly think Israel has done anything to ramp the escalation down since then. Um, but neither is Hamas. It's still holding hostages. It's still torturing them, doing God knows what to them. We saw the horrors they were doing on October the 7th. What are they doing to those people now still in custody? It doesn't bear thinking about. Um, it's the most horrific situation. I've, I've travelled in Israel. I've travelled in Palestine. This is many years ago when I was there. I, I didn't see a two-state solution because the two sides seemed so intractable. OK, Rehan? Well, I do believe in the two-state solution, and that's something I think the international community needs to pressure Israel to work towards. I think it's absolutely horrific what took place on October the 7th, and Israel was justified in responding, but it had to do so in a proportional way. And I think what we're seeing now is literally the levelling of Gaza. And we need to learn the lessons of history here. We saw what happened in, his, uh, in Iraq sorry, and Syria. They were ravaged by... A decade of war and then what came isis and i just worry that no one is thinking about what comes next it's going to cost a lot of money to rebuild gaza billions maybe even trillions and no one's even asking that question but more than anything we are seeing a humanitarian emergency and i think 
it is going to be absolutely destructive. But to answer Hassan's question, should we follow the lead of the Dutch on this? I would need to look into that personally, um, myself, before I made a decision on that. But I think, uh, as Suzanne said, you know, the Dutch have made their decision. But it's something that we should consider because, you know, Israel's an ally. But I think they have grossly overreached in their response. Okay. Liz? Well, I'd say, Hassan, let's he who's not sold arms to some dodgy, oppressive regime throw the first hand grenade. You know, everybody's hypocrites in this. It's almost poetic. Yes, I thank you for that. <laughs> um, I just find this whole... I said this from day one, like October the 7th. This whole thing is obscene. And of course it is. And um, you cannot... Uh, you know, you cannot bomb out an ideology, which is really what is being attempted here. You, but you... you well, they, uh, the Israelis would say they're trying to kill terrorists who have been trying yes, to kill I, them for, for yes. years. And I understand that, and I, I, and I respect their aims. However, I heard this analogy some years ago. If you've got a bathroom floor full of cockroaches and you spray into it, it'll just, they'll scatter like that but they'll regroup and come back. You can't stamp it out with weapons and bombs. And yes, they say, the, the guy from uh, the Israeli Defence Force who I saw on the TV at 5.30 tonight seemed entirely reasonable, but at the end of the day, they have an objective which cannot be achieved. So it's no use just having one court in Holland ruling that you can't provide a spare part for a certain horrific weapon. The whole of the Western world has to come together and decide what the policy is on this. Not fragmented, not Biden saying something and Macron posturing and maybe making a trip over to Lebanon. The French Lebanon. president posturing. Right. Yes, what on earth are you saying? Do you remember when? Like, do you remember when that? Do you remember when that bomb went off in Lebanon? It was straight there, and somebody Lebanese told me the other day. I oh, got on all the pictures on the telly. He's done nothing since. He went over to Libya, didn't he? When Cameron did, and I told, uh, then then they just forget about it and move on. So yes, I'll use the word posturing if you don't mind. Totally agree with you, uh, Josh. Yeah, I mean, what kind of moral arrogance does it take for a court in Holland to decide that it knows what the right answer is to this very complex, very ancient conflict in the Middle East? Um, so to directly answer the question, no, I absolutely do not think that we should be going that way. And in fact, you know, this is not a, this is not a legal problem. It's not for courts. It's about politics and war and lives and states. Um, and I think in general, you know, we, we, we tend to reach for courts to provide some clarity on these things, and we shouldn't. It's about politics and it's about negotiation between governments. I mean, let us not forget that Israel, despite the fact that it's currently gripped by a egomaniac at the moment, is one of the only successful flourishing mm -hmm. democracies in that region. That is something that we must cling on to, and actually we must support those in Israel, in my opinion, who are trying to fight for democracy now and against someone who's essentially got an iron grip over the Israeli state. So I think the, the, the big problem with Israel is Netanyahu. He is the thing that is standing in the way of a serious and sustained negotiation and peace. Why a Dutch court thinks that, you know, withholding a few F-35s and issuing some judgment is likely to make any difference to that complex problem whatsoever, I don't understand. And I think it would be uh, a crying shame if the British courts were to now think that a similar pattern... Which it may depend that um, somebody will now be bringing a case through the British courts. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm looking at you, Jolie, and Mom. It's 8.30 on LBC. We'll take more of your calls in just a moment. Uh, let's get the news headlines from Tim Daly. The Labour Party has announced it's withdrawing its support for the Rochdale by-election candidate, Azar Ali, after remarks he made about Israel. A recording of him emerged where he appeared to suggest the country had deliberately lowered its guard against October's Hamas attacks. You can find a full listing of the candidates standing in Rochdale at lbc.co.uk. The head of the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees says he does not plan to resign over claims some employees were involved in those October 
October the 7th attacks. 12 staff members were fired and several countries, including the UK, pulled funding for the UN Relief and Works Agency. And the Justice Secretary and the family of a victim are criticising a decision by the Parole Board to grant a fresh hearing for the double child rapist and killer Colin Pitchfork. He's challenging a decision made in December which said he couldn't be freed. LBC weather staying windy with scattered showers in Scotland tonight. Dry for Northern England and Northern Ireland with a few showers further south and a low of minus two degrees. This is LBC. A34 in LBC. If you just joined us, we have on the panel Liz Kershaw, broadcaster and DJ, Josh Simons from Labour Together, Rayhan Hack, who is an independent candidate for London Mayor, and Suzanne Evans, political commentator and former Deputy Chairman of UKIP. Uh, Rayhan, why on earth are you standing as an independent? You know you're not going to win, so what's the point? Oh, I'm running as an independent because London's in crisis here and the status quo is well and truly broken. We've had eight years of failure under City Khan. We've had 14 years of failure under successive Conservative governments. London is crying out for real change. The only way to get that is with the new mayor. has got the skills, the ideas and the experience to build a new London. That's why I'm running. But any of the sort of standard candidates would say exactly what you've just said. Obviously, Sadiq Khan wouldn't criticise himself, but, I mean, a Liberal Democrat would say exactly what you've just said. What differentiates you from others? Well, first of all, I don't think they would say that, because Sadiq Khan last year actually at a conference said London wasn't in crisis, yet we have a house crisis, we have a knife crime epidemic uh, raging across the city, we have street um, crime epidemic uh, that's engulfed the city as well. And, and the city's not even ready for AI, which is going to be the biggest transformative change that we see in the next decade. So I think 
What distinguishes me from all the other candidates is that I spent 10 years working as a social justice advisor, tackling some of our toughest challenges in the city, and I get results. So most recently, I led a national campaign to create something called a Community Wealth Fund, which puts power, wealth, and opportunity directly in the hands of local people. I'm the only candidate that can say in the last year, last few years, they have successfully changed government legislation, then secured hundreds of millions of pounds worth of new investment. And the best thing about it, local people decide how that money is spent. So I'm someone who knows how to tackle problems and then get results. And I don't think any other candidate can say that. Right. Um, I want to see how in touch with London you are. Okay. I've got four questions designed to catch you out. Oh, God. Hit me. Which I have to say, obviously, nothing to do with me. I wouldn't no. indulge in such childish games. <laughs> What's the average salary of a police officer in London? £37,000. Yeah, I'll give you that. Well, I'm told it's nearly 40, but that's sort of within the, within the ballpark. Um, which tube line is Shepherd's Bush on? That's on the central line. Correct. Uh, which zone is Collindale in? That's Z gotcha, hasn't it? Zone That's gotcha. three. Nearly four. It's four. Um, who owns Hammersmith Bridge? Hammersmith Bridge is owned by Hammersmith and Fulham council and just on this so i think this shows how the status quo in london is broken because this is something that could be solved easily and as mayor if you know if given the chance i would get this done and what's a bus fare a bus fare is one pound 75 i'll take your word for that because i have no idea <laughs> i do go on buses but i pay with a card so i'll give you a bonus on this zone one fare is two pound 80 on the tube. He, he's got it hasn't he but do you were you not tempted to try and stand for one of the main parties i mean you said you were for you were in Labour. Yeah, so I was involved in the Labour Party for 10 years up until 2019. I left for a number of reasons. Uh, I didn't like the position on Brexit. I, I didn't think the Labour Party came out hard enough. I didn't like how anti-Semitism had engulfed the Labour Party. But I think more than anything, I just saw how broken the petty factional politics is politics that engulfs our system is. And I think working as an independent, I've been able to show that you can bring people together, you can create coalitions of change, and you can actually get things done. And I think in London as well, a city as glorious as us, we have 9 million people, and we only have, at the moment, a choice between a third-term city Khan mayorship, and he's run out of ideas, or I think a Susan Hall disaster. So I'm trying to give London a real opportunity for Hashtag hope, safer with Susan. Um, or better with Rayhan. <laughs> Well, I'll give you credit for being persistent because he, he's been DMing me all the time on Twitter saying, when are you going to have me on your programme? <laughs> uh, we've got Rob Blackie, the Liberal candidate, Liberal Democrat candidate for London Mayor on next week. Right, let's go to another question. It's from Martin in Doncaster. Hello, Martin. Uh, hello, Ian and panel. The question is, is, what does it say about the Conservatives when you've got decent MPs like Tracy Crouch stepping down? Um, Tracy Crouch, the MP for Chatham and Aylesford, she's been in Parliament since 2005 and she announced that she's stepping down at the next election. I think a lot of people, well, judging by the comments on Twitter, a lot of people really disappointed by that decision. Um, I can completely understand it, though, because I think a lot... Generally, MPs are being elected at a much younger age. And when, I don't know how, exactly how old Tracy is, but I, I, uh, now I'm going to put my foot in it, aren't I? Shall we say she's late 40s, early 50s? I think that's probably quite accurate. You've then got... You're at an age where you think, well, I've got time to have another career. Mm. And if you face 10 years in opposition under a Labour government with a massive majority... Well, she worked for the Conservatives when they were in opposition before. She knows what it's like. So I, I don't blame her for it, but Parliament will be the poorer without her. Um, Liz? I thought you were going to start talking about her fecundity then. <laughs> a a woman of a certain age. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I've always said that women... Well, she has got a young child, and well, I know yeah. she's devoting a lot of time to it's him. And rightly so. It's difficult, I've always said, to be an MP and a mother. I know it myself from having a politician mother who's never at home in the evenings. But I've always said women should, older women should be encouraged to become MPs. They've brought up their families, they've had the experience, they've had a career, and then they don't have the worry of childcare. Have you ever been tempted? Um, well, I was approached Were you? on a balcony in Charles Kennedy's flat once, but I said, I'll think about it in 20 years. It was about 20 years ago. I think most of these MPs are being practical, aren't they? Pragmatic. They're thinking, I'll put all this effort in, and because of things that have nothing to do with me, the national scene and mood, it's, I'm going to be wasting all that time and I'm going to be out on my ear. So I might as well just bow out graciously. I think there's also fear. We've had a couple of MPs 
murdered, haven't we? And we've had somebody's constituency office torched because he didn't support calls for a ceasefire by Palestinian supporting protesters. More than protesting when you set fire to somebody's building. And I think that it's a frightening job now. And it's not actually for the hours and the commitment and the aggro. It's not that well paid. You could earn similar amounts doing much cushier jobs. And I just think that... Why uh, did you look at me when you said that? <laughs> well, I've done it myself, and I know. <laughs> and you get paid far more for being gobby on the radio than you do for being Surely not. Not what, tonight, what obviously. But in the past. But I, I think um, people are frightened. I genuinely do. And it does make me ask myself, do I want to be an MP? Do I want to put myself out there? Do I want to expose myself? Unless I lock myself in the office, am I going to, I want to go out and I want to, going to meet people. I don't want to have a panel of glass in front of me. I went to see my MP. Andrea Ledson and um, she you know it was like oh, there's a posh constituency oh that you live god in. she's got a huge majority 33,000 I said I think to myself no point voting they so often quite often Labour doesn't put up a candidate anyway she was flanked by blokes we were you know it was like it's like getting to see the wizard in um <laughs> Yellow Brick Road, was it of Oz? And I thought, this is horrendous. You should have just been able to walk in. You know, like you could in Simon Danchuk's constituency yeah. 15 years ago. But it's right. So I think people are scared of the, for their own safety, for their families. They, they feel pressured to... Uh, to to, they, they don't feel that they can speak out and say what they really think and they think they're going to lose their seats anyway mm. so why bother? Mm. Suzanne Evans I mean Tracy Crouch was always a very independent minded MP, mm. didn't particularly always follow the party work, was quite outspoken Parliament needs people like her Absolutely, but my understanding is what she's saying is that she's standing down because she's had cancer, because she's got over that experience but it's kind of obviously made her look at life in a different way and I totally understand that, being someone who was never an MP but very much involved in politics very much in the public eye got cancer stepped back thought heavens above you know oh, let's just it's, it's it's such a high powered stressful job and it those kind of things do make you re reassess but i think it's interesting in what you were talking about younger politicians i went into politics when i was 45 and i think that's a great age yeah. to go in politics i think i had the life experience i think i had the mo emotional resilience to deal with the job um and i just knew a little bit about life i wasn't someone that you know had gone straight from university to working for an MP to becoming an MP, of which we were talking earlier about how many working class people are there on the Labour benches. I think across the, the whole of the House of Commons, really, there are too few people, in my view, who've had some real life work experience before they've gone into politics. And I think that's part of the problem with politics, is that it's seen now as a career because choice. she was an example of somebody who did go into she politics, did, but, having, but worked, having say, worked for MPs. She was independent. Michael David Davis. She was outspoken. There's always the, uh, the exception that proves the rule, if you like, isn't there? And, and, and I wish her every bit of luck in what she's doing. But Liz is right. It's a difficult job. You're constantly under scrutiny. Everybody either agrees with you wholeheartedly or disagrees with you and hates you. And it's an incredibly difficult, time-consuming job, particularly if you have got a family. There's no doubt about okay. that. I mean, I was lucky, as I say, my, my daughter had pretty much grown up by the time I got involved. Mm -hmm. Josh. Well, I've got two young kids, so uh, three and just actually one on Thursday. Um, so juggling these things is something uh, I, I know well. And, you know, having watched, having, having got to know many uh, MPs up close, it is particularly difficult, I think, for women. The, the type of sort of violent vitriol they face online um, just is different to the male MPs that I um, know and have seen. And I think there's a lot in, in in what Liz and Suzanne have said. I mean, the bottom line is that we should think of politics as a um, real responsibility that we respect, that we cherish, that we, you know, remunerate properly, but also we give politicians time and resources to do their jobs properly, and we don't. Um, and I think, you know, while some of the churn that we're seeing in this parliament on both sides of the aisle, actually, but particularly the Conservative side. Well, some of that churn is just, you know, what happens when there's going to be a big swing. You know, in 1997, there was a huge number of Tory MPs who said they were going to stand down. I also think some of it is about how difficult it is to be a politician for a very long time, given the political culture that we now have. 
So I think it's always sad when a woman in particular who uh, has done a difficult job and suffered a lot of crap online, forgive my French, uh, leaves because they have, they think, you know what, there's other things I can do that will change the world more. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, I don't know Tracy personally, but I know people who do. And they have immense respect for her intelligence, her independence, her judgment. Uh, and Parliament is always at a loss when you lose people like that. And I think there is something wrong with how we do politics if people like that find, you know, that job inconsistent with their own temperament and, and character. Graham. So, uh, first of all, I just want to say um, huge thanks to Tracy, because I think she has been a very good MP, and she was a, a passionate supporter for that campaign for a community wealth fund. Um, but there is something nasty about our politics. And, you know, I've only been a candidate for a couple of months. I'm a fresh face, you know, a challenger to the established order. And I've really experienced uh, a lot of hate. It doesn't really bother me, but... Mm -hmm. I'll be honest, quite a lot of racist. If you just go on social media, you'll see it, particularly on TikTok. And uh, I did one video in particular that really got under the racist's uh, skin, which is that I will tackle knife crime within two years. So the trend on knife crime has been uh, increasing. So since Sadiq Khan took office, it's gone up 54% uh, in the capital. So I would reverse that trend and start getting it falling within two years. And if it didn't, I would resign. Because I think politicians need to be held accountable. And I'm a results-focused person. And that video in particular, you know, there's 250-plus comments on it. And, yeah, it is scary how, you know, horrible those comments are. And for them, there's nothing to do with my politics or what I'm looking to do. It's all about the, the colour of my skin or, or what they think my religion might be. So I, I, I do think there is something really nasty going on in our politics. And I think we've got to try to find ways to get rid of that hate of social media, but then also try to bring about a better politics. I'm trying to take the concept directly to people and have more open discussions um, involve members of the public. Because I think if you do that, then you take out some of these uh, echo chambers that people live in and, uh, you know, obviously purport their nastiness right we'll move on in just a moment and of course stay listening till the end of the hour at least because you will find out what our fun text question is which i'm now about to brief i, uh, I was gonna say our candidates on our panelists <laughs> on it's 8 48 lbc
8.51 on LBC. Just to say, after nine o'clock, we're going to turn our attention to Donald Trump's insane comments about NATO, which, if you've heard them... I'd like to think most of you would agree with me that they are absolutely insane, effectively encouraging Putin to invade NATO countries. I mean, the words almost... I'm almost at a loss for words to describe how I feel about this, but there may be the odd person out there who disagrees with me, so we're going to talk about Donald Trump and NATO after nine. Right, uh, our next question is a text question from Simon, who says, Parliament's Human Rights Committee says the Rwanda plan is fundamentally incompatible with human rights law. Does your panel agree? Uh, now, MPs and peers from the Cross-Party Joint Committee on Human Rights warn that uh, disapplying certain laws would put the UK's hard-won reputation for the rule of law and human rights in jeopardy. Ray Hanhak. I would agree with that because I think this whole policy is a distraction from the failure to deal with illegal migration and the disaster that has been Brexit. If we had remained in the European Union, we would not have the small boats problem. We'd be able to work effectively with our allies across the continent to deal with this issue. And I just think this is such a bad stain on our country that we're willing to spend huge amounts of money on a policy which is impractical but is also, I think, illegal. Suzanne? I, I don't think it's uh, it's wrong at all. Um, we have appalling levels of uncontrolled illegal immigration. Up to 500 people coming across the channel in small boats every day, uh, putting them into migrant hotels at a cost of, what is it, £8 million a day? I'm not quite sure what the cost is. It's absolutely astronomical anyway. We don't know who these people are. We've just had in the last couple of weeks a series of the most horrific violent crimes that have been committed by illegal migrants and the country wants something to be done about it. Now, personally, I'm not convinced that the Rwanda plan is going to work. Um, I think, you know, if, if, if it's going to work, we're going to have to leave, I think, the European Court of Human Rights because until we do that, activist lawyers are going to keep on pushing back and pushing back against every deportation. We're going to have the uh, pyjama injunction that we've seen uh, when the first time we tried to get flights off to Rwanda, they were stopped dead in the water by, 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 by injunctions. Um, but people want to stop the boats and something's got to be done. As I say, I'm not convinced it's going to work, but... Are you quite happy to spuff 400 million up the wall? No, I'm never happy. I am absolutely <laughs> never, never happy to spuff Well, how can you support a policy that you don't think will pieces? work? Well... I don't, well, that's the trouble, isn't it? I don't particularly support the Rwanda policy because I don't think it's going to work. But we've got to do something. And I think the more people try and make out, they're kind of ignoring the vast majority of people that want to stop these boats and want something done. And you've got these kind of extreme left-wing human rights activists. And we all want to support human rights, let's be clear. But whose human rights? We've, as I say, we've got victims as a result of these, these, these men, these often violent men coming over. These victims are often women. Uh, and people that just say, oh, we've got to keep them here, we've got to do something. It's, I, I just despair, actually. I despair that the, the government hasn't come up with a better plan than Rwanda to deal with this. I despair at the people that are just opposed to any kind of plan the government comes up with. Um, I just despair. You just despair. <laughs> Josh, <laughs> relieve Suzanne of her despairedness. Well, we at Labour together don't just despair, we try and think about what we should do about it. Um, because I agree with a lot of the, the diagnosis there that Susan gave, but um, we need a prescription, you know, we can't just leave, leave this situation as it is. My main concern with Rwanda is not actually the, the human rights implications of it and the focus of this report. My main concern is that uh, it's a complete waste of money and it won't work. It won't stop the boats. You know, that was the thing that Rishi said, judge me by, stop the boats. He's failed. Yes. He keeps failing. And meanwhile, he's spending £8 million a day and so far, £400 million quid. Um, so my problem with Rwanda is that it, it won't work. So the hard question is, what are you going to do instead? Um, and I think that while the Conservatives say that they are being tough on the borders and beefing up the policing and so on, I have seen no real evidence that that is in fact what they are doing with the kind of commitment and clarity that they need to. I mean, you know, why don't you send the smuggler gangs and put them on the barge that, you know, has been set aside for the asylum seekers to do it? And then, you know, ship the barge up to the north of Scotland for all I, you know, who, who cares? We should what have, have you no... Got to get Scotland? 
No, well, yeah, sorry, Scotland. <laughs> uh, uh, you can sort of float it off. Would that be more scary than Norway. Rwanda? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's certainly... I, I think cool. you, you wouldn't have any nice in the way of that cool The answer is definitely, I think, offshore processing here. It's making sure that okay. anyone that comes Listen, across... We're it, running out of time. I want to get a okay. brief answer, if I okay. can, from, uh, from Liz here, and then we're going to fit in another question. I hear such sort of naive answers to this question and what you've got to do is look what's going on across the whole of Europe the violence we've seen recently in England against women or children or in the streets, acid attacks etc, it's happening in Ireland as we've seen uh, two gay guys beheaded mm. um, by a migrant with the, the kids attacked at a school before Christmas, loads of examples in Ireland, we've got masses of examples more so in France, Sweden mm. Dem um, Netherlands it's a European wide I'm talking not EU but continental problem because the world is on the move and and we can't just see it as we're the end game you know they get that far and they speak English and they might have family so they want to come here that's the end game they've already crossed they've already swarmed into Italy so we've all got to work together to solve this that, that's all I would say but I'm glad to see uh, Carey, the ex-Archbishop of Canterbury today, say mass migration is causing a breakdown of our social structure. People feel the culture's been undermined. It causes crime. And as he said, it's not the elite that are directly affected. It's not the rich, the wealthy, the powerful. It's the people who are in competition for first homes, for low-paid jobs, uh, for school places. And, and yes, we need to do something. Um, I wanted to get a question in on cars, but um, I don't think we've really got time to do that, which is a bit annoying, because I got a speeding ticket the other day. Were you in 22 no, in a 21 I was hour. doing 66 in what apparently has now become a 40 limit. But up until I got the ticket, it was 70. And okay. they produced it without, so, without any notice. This is on the A20. Nick Ferrari is doing a, a feature on mm. this tomorrow, and I think BBC South East News have done it. There's a big campaign because apparently hundreds and hundreds of people are getting nine points on their license mm. for, for doing this. That's literally, I've currently got nine points on my license for it because, so have I. in fact, not far from. <laughs> From Rochdale, if you're going from Rochdale to Heimburn, one of those roads has changed. Oh, you can really get your tour down there. Any signs that tell you that? <laughs> anyway. Um, Corey just says, you you have an innovative car policy. What, what was that, Corey? Mm. I can tell you. Oh, go like. on, you tell me about it. So, I, I, I went on a fact-finding mission to, to Paris to see how they change in the city in the wake of the pandemic, but also in the run to the next Olympics. And one of the things they do, they have car-free Sundays on the first Sunday of each month. So, they shut down some of the central arrondissements, central parts of Paris, and just for a few hours and allow you know walkers and families and cyclists just to take it over and i would do something similar in london just one day a month uh, around places like the mall you know oxford street regent street just where it gets really busy and just allow people to enjoy um a day without cars that's his pitch for you vote ladies and gentlemen right our fun, our fun question from greg <laughs> who says last night's super bowl saw an all-star performance from usher and friends if we had a super bowl style halftime show during an fa cup final who would be your ideal headline act dead or alive liz kershaw well, they were a great band. From <laughs> <laughs> you spin me right round like a record good, baby. Yeah, yeah. Stock at Kim Waterman's first number one. Um, right, I would. This is why we have your. I would program. quickly say, dead, if, 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 I would have Dusty Springfield. She's oh, simply, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe possibly apart from Aretha Franklin, the greatest female vocalist ever, and um, what a joy! And, and so quintessentially. British. They've got to be British and not past it. I'd rather have somebody who's dead than somebody who's struggling at 80. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Uh, Josh? Uh, it would probably be Oasis. Don't yeah. look back in anger that moment. I'm sorry, but it would be. That would be a pretty special Good one. On that pitch. Cigarettes and alcohol. Exactly. Rayhan? For me, it would be Woodkid belting out their tune, Rumble Who? Woodkid. So they'll be belting. Is that a popular music beat? <laughs> <laughs> it's a combo. Well, no, so Woodkid <laughs> and uh, playing Run Boy Run because it's the campaign song for my campaign. Uh, okay. uh, Suzanne? Well, it's got to be Queens. We are the champions, surely. Ooh. No. No. <laughs> I, would ha I would have a South African band called Mango Groove. Look, ah, them, up. Yeah. Okay. Look them up on YouTube. Your mind will be blown. Uh, Liz Kershaw, Josh Simons, Rayhan Hack, and Suzanne Evans, thank you very much indeed for gracing our panel tonight.
tonight. Uh, we have another one for you at 8 o'clock tomorrow night. I can't tell you who's. Actually, it's an international special tomorrow night. We're going to solve all the world's problems on Cross Question uh, tomorrow night. We have uh, Lord Kim Darrock, uh, former National Security Advisor, Isabel Hilton, uh, the journalist, and uh, Michael Clark.